Everybody on their feet and give it up for Alex and Scott Nolan. Hey everyone, I'm Alex, and yeah, I'm Scott. Uh, thanks for the intros. Um, so let's see, where should we start? I think most people are here to hear from you today. Probably uh, not. Here, I like, it. I mean, I think you guys. Well, so let's step back for a second. I, we'll we'll give you a chance to talk through what you do, what Branch is all about. Um, but I think you guys are on a really interesting trajectory that not a lot of people get to experience. It's going from you know having one product and then kind of find, finding your product market fit um, and then just seeing, like, seeing insane scaling. So I think um, it'll be good to talk through some of the stuff that comes along with that and some of the unique things that you've seen um, and hopefully we can you know, answer audience questions at the end. Um, and so yeah, I got a brief background, uh, talked about me, I'll just give a little bit more, you know, a few more details. So I'm a partner at Founders Fund, we're looking at all different sectors, all different stages. Um, the number one thing we're always focused on is just trying to back companies that we think are gonna redefine their industry and be around for 10, 20 years. Um, so it's all about, you know, let's just find those companies and it doesn't matter what stage they're at, what sector they're at, what geography. Um, and so actually one of, one of my friends who was interviewing with you guys introduced us. He said, you know, I just talked to this company. They're gonna change the way that uh, mobile discovery happens and you've got to talk to them. And so he's like, yeah, and by the way, you're, you're, you're really going to get along with the company and get what they're doing. So we met up uh, one afternoon and talked a lot about the vision of changing, um, you know, mobile discovery and search and, and so here we are. So, um, so yeah, I think we'll make this all about, about you and Branch tonight. Um, <laughs> not to put you on the spot, but um, yeah, do you want to give Maybe we should start with just like the overview of what Branch does and like a super explicit shameless plug so that yep. everything else after this cannot be advertising. Yeah, so uh, I'll try to make it like everything after this and the stories that I tell be as like real and true to probably a lot of the experiences that you guys are going through now. Because uh, I presume that majority of the group is our entrepreneurs actively working on companies. Um, but yeah, so let me give you a little description of what Branch is because it'll help frame overall like, you know, the rest of the discussion. But we provide deep linking as a service for apps. So you're probably like, what the heck is deep linking? And deep linking is a new concept. It basically makes an app have links like a website does. So an example uh, is that, let's say Zappos.com you maybe find like a pair of shoes that you think are really cool. You can send that link to that web page to a friend and be like, you love this pair of shoes. We allow you to do that with Zappos app too. So, you know, more real experience the one you probably see like daily. You click on a link in your email for like a LinkedIn, for example, and it takes you to the website, even though you have the app installed and all set up. So we make the app actually open up and like show you the page you clicked on. So that's a little bit about what we do. Um, and by the way, it's totally free to use. It will like, you know, improve your business if you're a mobile focused business dramatically. So check it out, you know, do all that stuff. Branch.io is the site. Cool. <laughs> all right, advertisement over. Um, let's see, so I don't think a lot of people wake up in the, you know, wake up one morning in bed and say I'm gonna start like a, a mobile deep linking company. Like, how did this come about? You guys were working on something else before this, right? Yeah, oh wow. So the, uh, just adjusting to that volume. So the, uh, we basically, like uh, just a little bit about myself, I'll, and it'll help frame the context of the transition, but I've, I've been in startups now for probably close to nine years, and I've been through some crazy, you know, ups and downs. I, the first company I worked on for about five years, I joined when there were about 20 people. We grew it to about 750 people. Uh, we had raised, I think, when I was there, it was about 30 million, and we raised about 550 million over the course of the lifetime. And the company was ultimately sold for 30 million 
to a Chinese conglomerate, and like most of those people don't work there anymore. Um, so, like at one point, you know, I joined. It was probably worth about 100 million or so, and uh, it was worth like 3 billion or something on paper. And you know, everyone's like counting their you know stock price, like <laughs> in options, and um, and then went to the like complete opposite extreme of that too. And after I left that company, uh, I I saw a lot of what they did wrong, and I thought that I could genuinely do a better job myself. And so I made the commitment that no matter what, I would work on my own company. Like I would build something from scratch, and this time not end up on the failure side of things, but like hopefully end up on the success side. And so over the course of about two, you know, two and a half years, tried many different things, one which ultimately led to branch. I was actually on, uh, I was more of a physicist, so I studied electrical engineering and with a focus on device physics, if there's anyone that's actually more in, uh, awesome. So, but I've always like, I, I did that because I found it incredibly hard to like mentally grasp some of the concepts. And I like that challenge of like not immediately knowing the solution when you're presented with a problem. But I always had this like hobby of software development. I would build a lot of apps on the side, mostly for desktop. When I quit, I had seen the phone start to take off this was now like 2012, so it's actually like, you know, pretty advanced at that point. And I was like, I want to get involved here. The company that I build will be in mobile. And so I just started building apps to get familiar with the, you know, ecosystem. Uh, it turned out to be a lot harder to build a successful company than I thought it would be going through that process. And so I applied to grad school uh, for the second time grad school down the road. And I applied to business school because I heard that you could actually go to business school, graduate, but like never do any work, um, which turned out to not be true. You actually have to go right. to class. It's all lies. <laughs> That's maybe that was like in the 90s, and I think too many people didn't go to class, so they changed the rules. Yeah, exactly. Like that, yeah, well, somebody from who graduated in 99 said that they never went to class. They were just like tanning by the pool all day, and I was like, awesome, I can like get a degree, take loans out, and fund my company based on and like do all this work and never show up to class, but still get a piece of paper at the end so my parents would be proud. Um, so it's like the, some like two year alibi or something. Exactly, like that. yeah. Um, so it was actually a really good decision because it's where I met my co founders for what ultimately turned into Branch. And so we built this one consumer facing mobile app, very simple premise. We basically were selling printed photo books. So you download the app and you could use photos and like arrange them in a layout and then we would handle the logistics of printing and shipping that photo book anywhere in the world. We got that business, we ran that all throughout like half of first and up and through second year of business school. We got that to be about like 700-ish K in annual revenue, um, but it wasn't growing really dramatically. Like it wasn't it was like we always found it was incredibly hard to source the next you know, 10,000 users for the app. And so we're always thinking about new ways that we could try to you know, convince existing users to down, like, you know, get their friends to download or open up new discovery pathways. And one of the things we, were, we felt was missing was like a linking tool. We wanted the ability just like very simply, I'll give you a use case where I create a photo book I want to send it to a friend, and that friend maybe doesn't have the app, but would click on that link, then install the app, and then see that book right away as the first screen. It happens very naturally on the web, where like you can send links around and people click on it and see that thing, but it's like impossible to do that in an app. And so we couldn't find a tool to actually help us do that. That's deep linking, as I described before. So we built this thing actually for ourselves. And it, we used it for like sharing, referrals, a bunch of advertising, all with the intention of personalizing the user experience when the user like clicked on a link and then entered the app. And we basically graduated. Uh, the app was like growing all right, but it wasn't like anything to write home about. And we'll talk a little bit more, I think, about that later probably. But um, we got to this incubator and all these other mobile companies saw this linking tool that we had built, and they're like, I want to use that too. And it, at that point, it was like a couple classes that I had written for Android and iOS. There was no documentation. It was like, you know, just this like super basic, like kind of like 
thing that I had built, and there was like immediately they were doing like going through heck trying to put it into their own app, like figuring out, dealing with all the bugs, like all this other stuff to use this linking tool that we had built. And meanwhile, I like we were struggling to get people to even like buy a photo book. And so this linking tool just started growing like crazy on its own pretty much. And so we made the decision by the end of that incubator session to sell off the photo book app and fo focus exclusively on the linking tool. So it's the same corporation. Our corporation now is like three and a half years old, but the tool itself is about like a year and a half old now. Um, but you know, it's, a, a, it's been a wild ride. So over the last year and a half, we went from like a few friends apps using this linking to tool, uh, processing probably like you know, 100 requests a day to now we process easily over a billion requests a day powering like you know links for um, Pinterest and BuzzFeed and like Zappos and others. So it's just been like a crazy last year and a half of you know scaling a company. So <clears throat> yeah, before when you were working in the photo book product, like you know you'd put all the you'd put all this work into it, and obviously there's probably a lot of momentum around that, and you could say well you know, do we know if there's going to be a really big business in this deep linking tool? And we've got this photo book thing, so why not just keep working on it? We'll crack the code. We'll make it work. Like, how did you actually get to that decision that, yeah, we've found something here that's got really good product market fit, and there's some runway, and it's not something that just anybody can build in-house? Like, what was the thought process there that got you from working on this first thing and then really changing directions fundamentally. I'm sure it was probably not an easy decision to sell that off, right? Yeah, I mean, it was making cash, which is nice. So <laughs> the, I think the thing that's most important and one of the things that I've seen now working on a bunch of like, I've, I've built probably about eight-ish apps, both Android and iOS, and gone through the like super excited idea phase, you know, product build, launch, and then shut down at the end because I didn't feel like they were working. And the app, the Kindred app, was really in the same bucket. And the process that I've seen that I think you have to set for yourself is one that isn't really talked about that much. Like, I, you hear mostly of these stories of people that were like born to build these companies and they were like, you know, they wake up every day and it's like their sole mission in life is to do this thing where really you have to be a bit more pragmatic about the decisions you make. You should know for yourself what success looks like. You should be able to say, like, you know, if I look, if I think forward 12, 12 months from now, what does this product need to be doing for me to still be excited to like work on it as opposed to working for someone else? And that helps you set your own internal success criteria that you should apply to your own companies. So like I think with the photo book app, we had some user growth goals, like we wanted to see a consistent, you know, new users buying photo books every month. And the other one was uh, just overall conversion rate from initial install to actually purchase. And both of those goals, after continually working on them, like we couldn't hit. Like we knew the writing was kind of on the wall that there was like not a lot of, you know, this wasn't going to be a really big business. And for us coming out of it, that's really like, for our own personal success, we really wanted to be a part of like a fast growing, you know, venture fundable company. And so for us, like we kind of like, it was pretty painfully obvious. And honestly, coming to that realization for me was probably one of the hardest times of my life of like, I remember there was like a couple of days where I had trouble getting out of bed because I was like, I had poured a year of my life into this product and done everything to make it perfect. Like answering support emails from like angry, angry, Midwestern moms at like Saturday night and like now coming to the realization that it would never be that like big thing that drove me to kill myself for, you know, so. Were your, so as you set these milestone goals and ask yourself, are we hitting our goals? Like were you guys, you know, there's like a few scenarios. You beat them, you basically hit them, maybe you fall slightly short or you just don't hit them at all. And I think probably one of the really hard scenarios is you're in this weird middle ground where okay, we're kind of hitting our goals. If we put a little bit more, more money into marketing, like I could see us hitting them next month. Like all we need is one more month. How do you think about, you know, okay, when do you say, no, this isn't quite working and we need to try something else? It's, it can probably be really tempting in this middle zone, right? 
Yeah, I think it's uh, like with the photo book especially because like we could probably pay rent for everyone that was working on it with the money we were making from it. And so it's like, you know, that was like, a, we were pretty proud that it was actually generating money and to like decide that this wasn't going to be the thing that we continued to work on was a tough call. But like you have to be, you know, regardless of what money you're making, like you have to be pragmatic about and stick to your, you know, success criteria that you set to make yourself happy. And if you're not seeing the growth numbers or whatever it is, then, you know, you got to make that call. Whereas with Branch, when we decided, like, let's give this a try, and we said, I think it was, like, first month, we'll have five apps integrated. And then second month, we want to double it. And then after that, we want to double that. And we just kept, like, blowing through our goals every time. Like, it seemed like things were just getting better. And so we were excited to, like, come in and, like, push ourselves harder to see where it could go, you know? And you need to have that momentum in the beginning because it only gets harder after that, so. Yep, and everybody was on board with the new direction. That's probably one other thing, right? Like, what if you have a team where it's split and some people say, no, we should stay doing this thing we were doing, and have you ever encountered that before? Yeah, yeah, I think it's a, so I've never, like, with our team, I think it's one of the best things that we've built is, is our founding team. So, you know, being together now for three and a half years, we've been through that cycle a few times and we are very pragmatic. We know we wanna build a large, like high growth company. And so for us, it was like, you know, this is a, like we love our users, we love this product, but it's not as exciting as this like amazing thing that just seems to be growing like crazy and like solves a huge pain point that we personally just like felt ourselves. So we get to solve that pain point that we solve for ourselves but now see that same, like, you know, that same reaction when we solved it in, like, you know, thousands of other people, too, which was, like, awesome. So, yep. didn't, you, you must have had some at SpaceX, too, where you had to make calls like that, too. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't making the calls, but, um, yeah, you know, I think it's one of these things where the same, kind of the same milestones were set from day one, and you have to ask yourself, well, what's driving the milestones, and I think, at SpaceX, it was really, this is going to be a, an expensive undertaking. <clears throat> we can't afford to try to launch a rocket 20 times with no success. Like, yet at the same time, we know most first launches don't work, so what do you do? So I think it was really one of these things where at SpaceX, Elon said up front, hey, we're going to try to do this three, three times, and, you know, we've got cash to go after it three times and get a successful launch, and, you know, the first two weren't that successful. Third one really almost kind of worked. It was like, it basically worked, except there was a little bit of instability in the upper stage. And at that point, I think everybody knew, okay, here's, here's what's ahead of us. We pretty much got to work, and number four is going to work. And so we had the money to, you know, do number four, thanks to Elon, and uh, it worked. I think if number four hadn't worked, it might be a different story. Um, but I think a lot of times, there's this question of, like, when do you stop? When do you go on to the next thing? I think the interesting case of like you can pay rent but it's not going to be more than that is a really tricky one. I think most of the time the world tells you, hey, it's time to stop because you kind of run out of money and there's nothing else to do. I think maybe the, the more important thing is identifying failure really early and just saying, no, we don't have product market fit. Um, let's change directions before we're out of cash and before the world tells us that we're done here. So I think, um, yeah, how did you guys approach that in terms of you know, or how are you even approaching it now? Like making sure you have the best fit with what customers actually want as opposed to just saying, you know, here's what we're doing, it's working, let's not listen to feedback. There's probably two ends of that spectrum, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it comes back to the, it's, it's even more dangerous now, I found, with Branch, we found this like amazing need that really any mobile developer has and see a lot of growth at the early product, but you like, you have to continue to launch things to stay relevant and expand on that core use case. But you feel a lot more confident in your own abilities than how you understand your customer at the stage where you have that, like you've had a success. And there's a huge risk that you get too smart for your own good and disconnect from, you know, your customer base when you get too pri like prideful of like, you know what's best. You know, when you get into that really the, like the whole Apple thing of like you know your like you know what your customers want like better than they do is like total bs like it, none of that like 
you can never get to a stage where you feel, that's like, if that thinking is so dangerous, it's like, so you're either gonna, like, you know, succeed wildly or fail miserably, and it's gonna be, the likelihood of that wild success is like a fraction of a percent. So there's a tendency for companies that do a second launch to basically have, um, go very strategic of like, this product would make a lot of sense for our business. It's like, it would put us in a good spot, but they forget about that they're building for their customer base. And they end up building like a second product that actually doesn't you know, meet a need that their customers have. And so we actually recently made this call with a product we were working on where uh, it made a ton of strategic sense. It was gonna be like very valuable if in theory, if it would work, but we set some initial criteria of like, you know, we want to have beta partners using it, you know, in the wild by like, you know, it was like six weeks after we started building. And we had trouble even find, like even from our earliest partners, like we had trouble um, getting anyone to sign up. They're like, oh, it sounds super cool, but like we'll put it in next quarter or like, you know, the quarter after. And that was, it was like a, a dangerous thing where like you, it's like you could kind of get this positive feedback that they were interested in it, but they wouldn't pony up to actually do it. And so we made the call of like actually after investing like you know a month into this thing that we got to shut it down. That there's got to be something that's like actually more suitable for our customers. And you just have to make those like, you know, set those goals of like, you need to see this success because that's what you need to like achieve whatever next stage of the company or whatever goal that you're shooting for after that. And if not, then like move on to the next thing, so. Yeah, so early on, I mean, you had some interest in the product. Uh, people, I guess you were, you were talking about the incubator accelerator and people wanting what you'd built. And so, you know, to get to that point where you have the luxury of getting comfortable and saying we know everything, like how did you actually get to that point where we've got a product now yeah. that people really love? Is it, you know, product market fit? Is it just some magical thing that you stumble across or is it, is there actually a process that you guys use to get there? Yeah, so I think for like for me, the thing that really triggered it was like with the photo book, I had to like photo book app, I had to convince my mom to download it and like start using it. And um, and she was like, well, I use Shutterfly. And I'm like, ah, come on. Like this is ours is way better. Like, come on, I'm your son, you gotta <laughs> use it. Whereas with like the linking thing, like people literally like they'd hear about it, not even from us, somebody else, and then come to us and ask to use it. And like still to this day, a lot of the people that come and use Branch are like, it's word of mouth referrals from friends. Like they hear about it and wanna come use it. And, and yeah, they're not all family members either, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think for us, it was just like a, that feedback, like you need to have that type of momentum because like just, you know, if you're having to sell too hard, it's just probably not a good, so, idea. I mean, it's, you said it started as a couple libraries, a couple basic snippets of code to, to make this happen. How did you figure out, okay, we've got something here, people want it, now we're gonna turn it into like a real product with like other features too. And how do we decide what features to have and not have? You know, how, like, I think that's a pretty basic thing and you get like, you know, feature bloat and people get really obsessed over their own products and this is what I would want and I'm gonna build all these things into it and then after they're all done, I'm gonna take it out to the market, everybody's gonna love it, like, or you just start, you know, doing whatever t people tell you to do, like, have no direction strategically in the product. How do you think about mapping that out? Yeah, so, like, the way that I thought about it is, you know, um, I had, back in the early days, we had just myself and my other technical co-founder who were building, writing code, and it was, like, we have a certain bandwidth of like things that we can build in time and there is the risk that we could end up working on things that we think are really cool, extensions that weren't you know, necessarily a need that the customer had. So what we did was we basically created this, um, and we, we don't actually use it now, but I was just like thinking we should probably incorporate it again. But the, um, what we did is every time we'd go on a call with a potential per like partner who wanted to know more about it, we would make a list of every feature that they would repeat back to us. So we would say like a ton of different things, you know, like, oh, you can do this, you can do that. And whenever they would be like, oh, that sounds cool, we just make a note of it. And then what we did is we kept a big board in the office that were post-it notes filled with potential features that we could build. If 
somebody mentioned something on the call that wasn't there, we would add a new post-it note. And if it was already on the board, we would just add a dot next to that existing post-it note. And basically what we'd do, we'd be like constantly building as fast as we possibly could. And as soon as we finished one thing, we'd go grab the next feature that had the most dots and then take that one off and then build that one and then move on like continually. And we basically started to craft this product that was like hyper focused on only the things that were most impactful to the largest number of people, which ultimately drove like, you know, continue to drive growth. So new features we add would excite like a whole new audience of people and like, but we knew there was a need there because we'd literally been on the phone talking to that person who was like, I would love it if it did this. And then, so they'd use it too. And then they, they feel like you built it for them because you like, you know, you didn't necessarily have it when they suggested it. And then they feel like, oh man, like Branch is awesome. They're like doing everything that I say. Like I'm like helping to build the product, um, which is really good for like community building and some other things too, but cool. Yeah, early on people in the, you know, in your, in your, in the incubator and in the accelerator, they were the people you were talking to to sell this. I think after that, you probably send emails out to your network, you scale it that way. How do you actually go from those, you know, high touch, let's call every customer sort of thing to actually scaling uh, sales beyond that or scaling adoption? I mean, you can't forever just like write emails to people you know, that's not gonna work for that long. Uh, you know, obviously there's like online marketing, SEO, like content marketing, but any any hacks that you guys have found that are really helpful in just building that momentum without having to like every day scale up something that's not ultimately scalable? Yeah, so um, this was not something that like we thought would actually be that useful, but reflecting back on it was immensely valuable. So uh, coming from the photo book world where you're servicing like, you know, Midwestern moms who might not understand actually like how to use the app and they get really angry when the book comes like, you know, half a day later than you said it would. And like, you get into this mode of like hyper customer service of like, you have to be there for your, like your customers and like constantly service their needs. So when we started building this product, we were like insane about our customer support. Anytime somebody would write in, like I basically, first off, I was doing all of it. So anytime somebody would write in, I would like, you know, I'm like a zero inbox type of person. So like I would reply to them within like five, 10 minutes and like answer whatever question they had. And they start to, you start to build like this like relationship with these people. They're like, I don't get what you just said. Can you get on the phone? And you're like, you know, five minutes later, you're on the phone with that person, like walking them through whatever question they have. Like we started to build such a deep relationship with all of the early adopters of our tech who were there like then like felt a part of branch as a company. Like they felt like they were, you know, just as involved as building the various features as we were. And that paid dividends like crazy throughout the, like over the last year and a half, either for, we've, we basically have turned that early base of, uh, of customers that we serviced really well into our community who we now, we actually do meetups um, all over the world as well, focused on mobile growth. We asked our partners who got a really great experience out of you know, our customer support to come and speak about mobile growth, their tactics, all that kind of stuff. And they're willing to do it like in a heartbeat because they feel like they owe us for the you know, service that we gave them. So if there's anything that like, I would say that you should invest in and should be your absolute top priority when it comes to actually starting to like scale this product is support. Just treat those people, like the way I described it to everybody now is like, we should be so lucky that they even write us a letter. Like th th it could be so much worse. Like the worst thing is the apathy where they just like hear about the product and then leave and then never come back. Like thank God they're sending us a, an email to ask us like how to do something. So let's treat them with the utmost respect that like we should honor their presence, you know, among us. And just that relationship you build, like, you know, that person will do anything for you. They'll tell all their friends, you know, speak on your behalf. When we did, when we raised money, they were more than happy to hop on the phone with an investor and do diligence, like all that stuff. So treat those people like kings and queens.
Yeah, and I guess that gets back to the, you know, the de designing the product sort of thing where, you know, by getting that feedback, you have a pretty clear idea of what, what your customers want. Um, and it probably helps you, you know, not start thinking that you know more than they know. But yeah. at the same time, I guess, part of the question was what's scalable? That doesn't seem, you know, you're probably not doing 24-7 customer support these days, right? I mean, you're not doing it at this very moment. Yeah, so I'm, we, we are, we're fortunate now where we're able to hire some really awesome people who do it. Um, and one of them is actually here right now, Ahmed. <laughs> um, but we, and, and they, you know, treat our customers with the same respect. And I still like, but to be perfectly honest, you know, up until we were able to hire some really awesome people, I've been doing support up like, you know, I think actually even when we were raising the Series B, I would come out of like an investor meeting and I would answer a like mm -hmm. ticket. Um, I spend a lot of like weekends if I can because I think it's so important for every employee to know like the customers and what people are doing and like be involved with it. So we actually just also started a policy now where everyone from, you know, the most senior person to um, like our office manager will be on support for one day every couple weeks. And they basically, you know, are in the thick of it answering super technical questions just like our awesome support engineers, so. Yeah, really cool. Um, let's see, yeah. Where should we take this? Like, what, what's, what's the next thing you think um, I think it's worth covering that like you guys have been through that that's like an unexpected lesson that you guys have found or you know something like that. I think um, you know one of the things that I've I've come to realize I think as we've scaled and it it you you do this naturally when you're in a small uh, small company but we're now a little bit over 50 people and one of the things that I've realized is like you'll have these wins you know when things are going well and it can cause a sense of like comfort. Like as an example, we had um, a competitor and like Pinterest was like their marquee client and we, after like a very long, many month investment, stole that client away from them. And um, it was like one of the most satisfying, you know, things ever. And there's like a tendency to want to like kick back and like, you know, celebrate that win and like, you know, maybe go to an, into a mode where you show up to work and you're really comfortable, but it's really, really dangerous to do that, like extremely dangerous. Because one thing I found is there's always something broken. There's like something on fire and you don't always see it. Like it might be something that's kind of like lurking and it requires you to like, you know, uh, maybe get a good night's sleep on, and like on a Saturday morning, just like think through like everything that's happening in the business and be like, one of you, one of these things is like not working well. And then I guarantee you, if you spend the time and do it, you will find one thing that's like not good enough. So never get into that mode of like, it's all good here. You know, it's at, we're at a point where um, we can like kick back and celebrate. It's like the next day you show up after stealing that big client, like spend the time and like take an inventory of everything at the company and make sure that like, you know, uh, I guarantee you'll find something on fire. So. Yep, it's like never, never rest on your laurels, right? I mean, I think the the other version of this I've heard is like, you know, somebody was talk somebody was talking to like a really successful group of people, or potentially really successful, and they were saying, um, you know, pretty much everybody here, as long as you don't think you're going to succeed, and you're just like always paranoid about failure, everyone here is going to do great. At the same time, if you assume that you're definitely going to succeed or you get lazy, that's when you don't succeed. So um, it's kind of like one of these things. In addition to like believing that you can do whatever it is you're setting out to do, you have to also believe that you can mess up. Yeah, like in, um, there's a, I mean, I think Andy Grove, of course, uh, you know, has the, the quote, only the paranoid survive. Like when we were with the solar panel company, we actually paid a guard to stand out by our trash 24 seven to make sure that nobody would go through and like sift through our trash. Cause we'd actually, somebody had caught one of our competitors at the solar panel company, like digging through our trash, looking for samples that they could come back, go back and analyze. And so it's just like, there's always something broken <laughs> and you have to like, you know, constantly be vigilant. And a more relevant like branch story, 
I remember in, in May um, last year, we, uh, like, I took a step back and it was, like, prepping for a board meeting and, and uh, I, like, pulled this one piece of data to try to analyze a little bit about, like, growth trajectory. And the way I plotted it, it became clear to me that, like, growth was, like, kind of flattening out. And the, I was like, okay, well, what's, like, something's going wrong here because we've been, like, it felt like things were, like, exponential up until this point, and we basically felt like we were hitting kind of a wall. Yeah, what was it, like, how did you discover this? Because, I mean, on the surface, it probably did look exponential, right? Yeah, so it's like, because I, you know, there's a tendency, even when you get to a certain point, the curves, like, even if you start to are linear, like, it's clear that you're actually not growing as fast as you are, but the curve still looks, like, exponential, because, you know, that, that Int exponential curve is, like, kind of can, you know, become a line. You need to do, point. it has to be log, log, plot, right? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> log, y-axis. Yeah, Remember? so we actually plot log Never scale uh, every, on all plots now for the board meeting. But the, um, anyways, but the, like, we basically found just, like, and I spent an entire weekend just digging through all data that I possibly could, and I found that um, it was, like, 60 or 70 percent of our signups were all happening in the Bay Area only. And we're a developer tool, and just like, you know, quick Googling around, I could find that the majority of app developers were not based in the Bay Area. So there was clearly something wrong about, like, the way that we were marketing and, you know, building a community such that we had, like, saturated, effectively, the Bay Area in terms of customer base. Yeah, what were you doing at that point? Like, why, why just the Bay Area? Were you doing... Yeah, so we here and ads only here. Like or? we found that the like develop and this is might be specific to developer tools, but it is a very word of mouth driven product. You know, people tell their friends like, you know, you're hanging out with your friend who's probably a developer at a company, and they'll mention this cool tool that they found or whatever. So it is like you know a very like local growth that comes through this like word of mouth for developer tools specifically, and so to help foster that. We actually started doing meetups focused on mobile growth and then getting, and I, as I mentioned, our partners to do it. And I think we had basically focused exclusively on Palo Alto and SF. And we were doing those over and over. I think in one of, like, an awesome, our biggest one had, like, 550 people or something up in the city. And that was, like, probably uh, the month before. And so we felt like things were amazing. I was like, how the heck is growth plateauing? And when we found it was like, holy crap, the, we're just like super saturated in the Bay Area. Literally, I think it was within three weeks, we had meetups in like three other cities and we flew people there. And then suddenly start, things started taking off again. Um, and so it was just like, you know, it's one of those examples of like, I guarantee something is always broken or about to break and you just have to be watching diligently, so. Yeah, it's almost like if growth you know, either growth is broken or you're growing so fast that it breaks something else. There's probably that version of it too, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, um, what it's been a, like an absolutely, for us especially, just scaling from, we had like a, you know, um, a single node API server and a node powered link server and one SQL database. And that was powering like 10 apps just fine. And when we started to process like, you know, hundreds of thousands of requests per second, like our, one of our uh, API calls was making like 20 database queries and it started, things started to crash. But meanwhile, like apps are onboarding, like things are growing like crazy and we're like, you know, so this new app flips on and we die like immediately. And we're like, what the heck, you know, we, you know, it was like, holy crap, like we're not, it's gonna, we're not gonna survive this and like getting to the point where you have to like tell them to hold off while you quickly go re-architect your whole like method of storing data <laughs> is like, a, you know, yeah, that's another th problem to deal This with. is not the type of thing where downtime is acceptable, right? Yeah, I mean, so. now we're like, you know, I think we had like five nines on our links over the last couple weeks, so it's like, we don't, it's like so far from, and that's, all, but, you know, a little more than a year ago, it, we were just going through hell trying to keep everything running, so anyways. Yeah, I remember at one point, I guess, thinking back to the, the customer service, uh, point you were talking about. I think it's one that a lot of people don't talk about and, you know, sure you hear companies like Zappos talking a lot about customer service and how important that is, but not a lot of, you know, high growth startups are, are really talking about that, especially like consumer internet, these sorts of things. So, um, I remember though at one point you did, you had some hack that you used that would tell you immediately if a company was good or not, right? So like, I think a lot of people here are, 
are startup people, like working at startups, but for those of the people in the audience that are investors, um, what was your hack? Uh, so my fiance is also in venture and she's always looking at new cool companies. By the way, sh she's at Cowboy, so you have a really gr if you have a great idea, um, I can forward it on to her. But I'll, I'm gonna put or, a filter. Or, yeah, or Founders Fund. <laughs> Um, anyways, but the, um, to test, <laughs> either way, test, we, we can co-invest. I mean, I'm, I'm like, you know, like I personally, like our unit, our portfolio is invested in, you know, um, cowboy. So, but anyway, so the, whenever we're, she's evaluating like a, you know, a company, my, I tell her to test them by sending in a support request, make a, a fake email account to like, you know, with a fake name. Uh, and then send a, an, a support request in on like Saturday afternoon and just count how long it takes for one of the founders to get back to you. And if it's like, you know, not till Monday, it's probably not a good sign for that because she's doing, you know, early stage company. So um, it's probably not a good sign. So <laughs> so if you guys are ever getting diligence by Cowboy, you better be answering support tickets on Saturday. Just watch out for those fake email addresses, right? You never know. <laughs> So let's see, so I think we've covered a lot of stuff. Anything else? I mean, I'm trying to think, anything we um, haven't covered? Yeah, I think uh, uh, like one of the other big takeaways that I also don't hear a lot of people talking about, um, and then maybe we can open it up to, to questions yeah. after this, but so ultimately, so I, I worked at this solar panel startup for five years, and I literally killed myself for this company. And it was like, a, you know, the way that it worked is, we pushed a tool, we started up a tool, it would run consecutively 24 hours straight for seven days, and you would be operating it like all through 24 hours. And so on the R&D team, you were responsible for just continuing to run experiments on this tool, and so you might have an experiment that you would run you know, from, uh, I don't know, 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. And so there were times when I would like literally go like, you know, three or four days without sleeping, running my experiments to try to get it done. So like I literally almost killed myself for this company. And ultimately what happened was like strategically in the long run, they had set the company up for failure and like it wasn't talked about. It might have been discussed at board meetings, but there were, there were you know, decisions made about the product that ultimately killed the company. Well, and what were, what were they optimizing for? Like, why make those bad decisions? So the, like, basically what had happened is, and it sounds silly in hindsight, but like, you know, probably a few billion dollars were poured into the solar panel industry. The premise of our product was that we could do, uh, like, create solar panels at a lower cost than, you know, a traditional manufacturer. So our competitive advantage that we were gunning towards was cost. And meanwhile, if you just plotted, like, the cost per watt is the, you know, uh, the standard metric. If you plotted the cost for a traditional solar panel, it would have shown that we would have been irrelevant by the time we were ready to launch the product. So there were decisions made to like basically set us up for failure. And these were made at like, you know, some of the best investment firms in the Valley, very, very intelligent people who would get in a room for board meetings, you know, uh, every other month and like agree that that was the right thing to do. And so when the company ended up failing, it was like, well, sh like, of course, like, it makes a ton of sense why we failed. Um, and I think the, the, the point, the lesson that I took away from that, and it's one of the reasons why I wanted to start, like, a company and try to set product strategy, is that you constantly need to be thinking about those, like, macro trends and where you fit within them, especially now where you know, it's so easy to build a company on top of a platform like, you know, a Slack or, you know, iOS or Android, like you're on such shaky ground and you're dependent on these other ecosystems to, and like the changes that they make. So, you know, like an iOS update or a Slack rolls out an update or like, you know, there's probably you've heard about like when companies depend on Twitter's API or whatever, like when you depend on these things, like you can't have those vulnerable spots or you will die. Like you can't depend your entire well-being on the fact that there's like something available that's ex that you exclusively have access to. And so when it comes to like building branch now, um, I am like always trying to think about, like I literally, I was just telling Scott, like I have a document where 
I have like the five-year roadmap that I foresee based on friends that I know at Google and Apple of like upcoming things that we anticipate them to launch that we can set ourselves up to block against if there's something that's threatening to us. So it's just like, you know, while it's like easy to get caught up in the day, like the today, like what's going on now and the problems that you're facing now, you constantly have to think about, like take a step back and it's good to do it on like a Saturday after like a good night's sleep, but like take a step back and like think about where you fit into the broader like platform that you're operating on because it will kill you if you're, if you're not careful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's about that long-term strategy to be around for 10 or even 20 years, right? I think. I think a lot of a lot of companies and a lot of people during their first startup underestimate that importance. So, um, one thing we focus on a lot is, and we've talked about this. I mean, I think during right before our investment, we spent hours and hours just talking through the strategy of how you stay relevant for 10, 10 or more years. And I think the thing that people forget about is, if you're an early stage startup, most of the revenues you're ever going to earn are, you know, they're certainly not this year. They're not even in the first five years. They're actually, on average, most of your cash that's going to come in the door, if things work, is more than 10 years out. So this question of how do you like position yourself and set up barriers to entry that are either like technology or network effects or you know any of the common ones, how do you build those into the business strategy from day one um, to put yourself on a really good course for that? And so I think that's that's something that. Some investors think about, I think nobody thinks about it as much as they should. I think most startups don't think about it as much as they should. Um, and I think the really great companies, like all the great companies, you think about it, they're not, they're not going away in three years. They're going to be around for a while. So, you know, I think that has implications about revenue. Like, when do you optimize for revenue? Do you try and make money day one? Or is it better to just constantly be strategic and constantly try and grow? Don't worry about revenue ever. I think there's a balance there. Um, I think sometimes revenue can be a strategic weapon. It can help you, like, you know, fund R&D effectively. It can help you test the market. So I know, you know, this is stuff we've talked about a lot. And, um, yeah, it's always the fun part of things is thinking through the strategy. And then, then you got to get down and actually do it. So um, in any case, yeah, maybe we open it up to the audience for questions at this point. <laughs>